Well, it's uh, 10.01. I'm a minute late. Uh, let's open in a word of prayer and uh, we'll start this lesson together. Uh, thank you, Father, for uh, another day to be together in common fellowship under our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for all the many blessings that you have given to us individually, as well as to this church, this locale, this body of believers. How grateful we are for the leadership of this church, uh, the elders, the deacons. Thank you for the gifted people that come here and their leadership among us. We're so grateful uh, for their force of energy and their willingness to take time and attention to the things that involve you. Truly, they will have a great and everlasting reward for their service. Uh, bless our morning message with Mark today. Uh, bless Dan. Be with him. Give him good rest and comfort today. And thank you for all that it, the activities that go on in this building throughout the week. Bless those who attend it. Now we ask, Lord, that you would attend your word. So is your word that goes forth from your mouth. It will never return void, but it will always accomplish the purpose for which you send it. So use your word with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. We're in the uh, 17th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we begin uh, with five today, I have, verses 18 through 22. Warren, I missed you. I needed your prayer. It's very disconcerting to have such a gifted leader as you not praying. 18 through 22. Of Proverbs chapter 17. One who clasps a palm is a man who has no sense. The one who pledges a security in the presence of his neighbor. Here is 19. One who loves strife is one who loves transgression. And one who makes his doorway high is one who seeks destruction. Here is 20. A person with a perverse heart does not find good. And one with a corrupt tongue falls into evil. 21. The one who begets a fool brings himself grief, and the father of a godless fool does not rejoice. And finally, number 22, our fifth proverb today, a joyful heart promotes healing, but a drained spirit dries up the bone. Now what you have here in these five proverbs is actually 18 and 22, are observations, but it's 19, 20, and 21 that we have two distinct personalities, two distinct people identified. So that's a good way to think about this particular text. Now let me tell you how I'm going to teach these, what I believe the scriptures are saying, and in plain English, this is the force of my delivery today. Verse 18, 
As believers, our focus should be on service, not balancing accounts. As believers, our focus should be on service, not balancing accounts. And here is 19. Two distinct fools that destroy themselves. Two distinct fools that destroy themselves. 20. Two predicates, that's predicates are in the proverb, we'll point them out. But two predicates tell us the fool's way. Two predicates tell us the fool's way. Here's 21. Two fools that bring sadness. Two fools that bring sadness. And 22. Here we have a contrast, a contrast of wisdom and the flesh. We always know we've got a contrast in the proverb when we see that but. And sometimes it is also translated and, which conjoins verses 1 and 2 of the proverb. But this is a contrast of wisdom and the flesh. Well, here is our exposition this morning. This uh, proverb, verse 18, is actually the skill for living in the marketplace. Wisdom among those who exchange. And the force of the proverb is never risk fidelity before a neighbor by assuming legal responsibility for one another's debt. What we have learned, we've learned a lot, haven't we, in the last six months of this virus, is how quickly things change. Nothing is predictable. And that's the way it is in the marketplace with finances as well. So this opening, the clasp of hands, is what we all know as the traditional handshake. And its parallel in line two is to the one who pledges. So the same warning of Proverbs 6.1, striking hands or clasping hands in a pledge. The word security here would refer to anything that one might put up as collateral in exchange for something, future payments, whatever. Line one declares that the one who makes such an arrangement, now look at this, he has no sense. Very forceful in the proverb. A term that refers to a man's inner mind or will. It's found 11 times in the proverbs. And it means the same thing. He's not thinking. Not thinking straight not thinking biblically or acting in that manner biblically. The phrase in line two, in the presence of, means in the company of. The neighbor here is a third party. He's the man on the street. And here he would be a witness to the transaction. That's very important. Because the neighbor is going to observe what goes on. Now, practically speaking, commercial lending firms have large sums to put at risk. And they use all kinds of collateral. That's what they are in business for. That's not this proverb. Back in 1996, I took out, for, which was at that time for me, a very large line of credit. And I can remember in the conference room, they brought all these documents in, and I was signing away. And I looked across the table, and I asked my banker, I said, Shirley, what is going to happen to me if I don't pay all this back? And she said with a smile, well, we'll just take your firstborn. <laughs> well, I said, 
That's no problem at all. <laughs> you try to feed him for six months, believe me, he'll be back with me. So I never saw myself at risk. And then I told them the story. There were about three of them, I think, in the room. I told them the story in 1 Samuel of the ark being taken away by the Philistines. And they sent it back. And it was so strange. I told the story, and it was silence. Silence. I don't know if they couldn't connect the stories or not, but it made me feel very uncomfortable. But that is for a commercial firm. That's not for a believer. That's the point. For practically, in a practical way for myself, I don't do loans. If I can help someone financially, I do it. And there's no strings attached. I don't expect and I don't want anything in return. And I truly think that this is the spirit uh, the, that the Apostle had regarding Philemon and Onesimus. Uh, the Apostle says, whatever he owes, charge it to my account. And then reminds Philemon that his very spiritual life was determined by the means of the Apostle himself. What's the force of that? That Philemon is a debtor to the Apostle. That's the way we should look at life. We're all debtors to one another. And the force of our spiritual walk should be we serve one another. Why would we lower ourselves to a standard of thinking about mammon when we should be thinking about service. What can I do to make you better than myself in a practical way? Which is the Apostle's admonition. Here's his admonition in force. Here's what I owe you. And here's what you owe me according to the Apostle. Love. I am obligated to love you. How much greater is that than mammon? That should be our focus, and that should be our lives as we go through our lives in the way, kindness, and counting others better than ourselves. Here's 19. One who loves strife is one who loves transgression. And the one who makes his doorway high is one who seeks destruction. Every teacher that I came across referenced this proverb as the most difficult one in the entire book. 1719. Why? Because lines 1... And line two are obviously talking about two separate things. They don't have a common connection at all or explanation. Line one is a fool who has a disposition to fight without any explanation. And line two, we have... The fool who exalts himself. I think the, the conservatives do point out that there is one common denominator between the two types of behavior. They're both headed for destruction because they're fools in their behavior. Now personally, I think that that's a very good explanation because both behaviors or lifestyles bring about death. Line one, 
the consequences of the one who loves strife. The one who, line two, lives in pride. Both of those are destructive behaviors. Now, I take this first individual who loves strife, either verbally or physically. And unfortunately, in my life, and I'm sure in many of yours, you've met people like this. They just love to get into it. One way or another. Always looking for an avenue to argue. Now that's a fool's behavior. And the proverb tells us, stay clear of it. In the last lesson, we noticed that word, to drop, in chapter 17, verse 14. Uh, Exodus 23, 11 used the word. It was of the seventh year of the farm in Israel. You were to drop it. You were not to plow it. You were not to cultivate it or plant it. You were to leave it alone. That's the idea here. Leave these people alone. Love here is mentioned twice. Notice it's tied to a transgression. Strife brings about its intended consequences, and that is transgression. Transgression means sin. Let me give you a text for that. Genesis 31, 36, here's exactly the way transgression is used. In Genesis 31, 36, that's the story of Jacob taking his two wives and all the children and leaving Laban and going back to the land of promise and God telling him it's time to go. And Laban pursues him. Laban's selfish, wicked. He catches up to him and we have this incredible scene of this father going through the tents, rummaging through, looking for things that Jacob has perhaps stolen. I, I, in my mind's eye, I think of maybe they put a some kind of oriental rug out there. You had all these family members, the clans, all together. And they're surrounding Jacob and his two wives and children. And uh, I, I, I'm sure in my mind's eye, I, I probably don't have this right, but I, I just think of it as Jacob saying, whatever you find, put it out there. Let everybody see it. He was so confident. And of course, Laban found nothing. That's when Jacob let him have it. Here's the text, 3136. Jacob became angry and went after Laban and his allegations that he had stolen from his father-in-law. Listen to this. Here's your word, transgression. What is my transgression, said Jacob, and what is my sin? See, transgression, sin, coterminous, one and the same, that you would hotly pursue me. So mark it very clearly. Verse 1, the top line, stay clear of this type of people and behavior. Here's the second line. Someone or something heightened. Job 39.27, the, the book of Job uses this word, the eagle builds his nest high. There it is. It carries the idea of inaccessibility. We can't get to it. And that's the idea that this fool wants to betray by this heightened doorway. Psalm 113, 5 and 6. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who is enthroned on high? There's our word. 
And he looks down upon the heavens and the earth. What's the point of the psalmist? As great as you think you are, God is always looking down upon you. And here's the warning from the proverb. To the one who exalts himself, mark it well, he is a short timer. Not long for this world. This doorway, entrance, used often for a gate. The high doorway is a picture of something being out of proportion. I think it alludes to the arrogant. And it's a symbolic feature of his arrogance. We say, he's a show-off. He is front-end loaded. It's all out front. And that's the way he portrays himself. Little does he know that in his foolish behavior of trying to display his power, his glory, his greatness to the smallness and weakness of others, who he compares himself to, he is destroying himself. I was uh, moved by Charles Bridges' commentary on Proverbs and here is his prayer at the end of this proverb. Lord, watch over me and preserve me from the first risings of a proud heart. Or if my frailty would yield to it, keep me from the prevalence of this presumptive sin that hurries me as a rival against your throne and would place me straightway to the pit of destruction. That's, that's the idea of the proverb. My friends, here is the spirit of wisdom, the skill for living, how dare we as believers who are totally dependent upon grace and mercy would think that we could be superior to anyone about anything. And that's the proverb. Here's 20. A person with a perverse heart does not find good. That's one person. Here's the second, the one with a corrupt tongue falls into evil. The proverb parallels the heart to the tongue. Both lines are observations of foolish behavior. There is now that familiar word perverse. We've seen it many times before from our earlier studies. Behavior of fool. The term is used in Psalm 18, verse 26, to the pure you show yourself pure, and with the wicked or perverse, there's your word, you are twisted, you are crooked. That's the word perverse. Explain to us. Here is the perverse heart. And the wise know it instantly by the words that they speak. The perverse heart is endured by a corrupt tongue. The profanity of people. Their hearts are vile. And that's the expression of the heart, what you hear. Their perdition is certain. And they're certain. Now look at your proverb closely. Look for the two predicates here. Line one, here's the first one. He does not find good. Now why is that striking? Because it's exactly the opposite of Proverbs 16.20 where the wise, he heeds, he listens to, he absorbs, he takes in wisdom. And guess what? 
he finds good. That's the proverb, 1620. The idea of good is prosperity, advancement. The response to the Word of God is growth. How many times do I think about that? And I think about my conversations with Dr. Johnson. It's like a, a, a tape recorder going off in my head. Him saying, our growth may be meager. It may look weak. But as we continue to proclaim the Word, it will be there. It will always be there. Look for growth. Now here is the second predicate. Line two. Looks at the, look at this one. Falls into evil. It's the picture of destruction. Isaiah chapter 3 and verse 8. Jerusalem will stumble. Judah will ruin. Meaning perish. And that's our word from Proverbs 17.20. The misery that this individual put upon others will now catch up to him. And how many times have we seen it? You know, uh, during the pandemic, I probably watched more television than I have in years. And I was watching the History Channel, and particularly the Nazi invasion of Poland. And they now have, I'm sure you've seen it, all these archived films now brought into color. It's amazing. And, but there are all these Polish Jews rounded up in this one particular scene they had the camera, and you could see the truck pulling up, flatbed truck, and they ran all of these Polish Jews out of the back of that truck. And right in front of the camera, and down into a long ditch. And there they just shot them dead. And covered the ditch. And then it dawned on me. Where did they find Hitler? Oh, he killed himself in the bunker. And then they dug a ditch. And they poured gas on it. And they burned his remains. But they found him in a ditch. The judgment of God may be slow, but its teeth grind exceedingly fine. What this man has done to others will be done to him as well. Here's 21. The one who begets a fool brings grief, and the father of a godless fool does not rejoice. This is an unusual proverb because it translates the word fool here that's used two times with two different words, not the same. The first fool is morally deficient, irrational, twist his values. But the second one you're much more familiar with, that is the word Nabal. It is the husband of Abigail. 1 Samuel 25. He's a fool. And what was his behavior? He was insensitive to other people. Plain and simple. And here the fool brings about his own ruin. And unfortunately, some, in some cases, the parents get to watch it with their own children. I think of David having to watch the destruction of Amnon and Absalom. The one who begets, see, to bear, to bring forth. The text says, brings himself, the parents against whom the fool disgraces. Look at this. 
grief. Now we know that word, Proverbs 10.1. Wise son brings joy to his father. A foolish son is, here's your word, grief. Grief to the mother. What the sons of Jacob brought to their father. Look. Look what we found. The multicolored coat. And it's dipped in blood. And they watched their father suffer. They brought him grief over their lie. What horrible people these are. You remember what the servant said, 1 Samuel 25, 17, regarding Nabal. The servant tells Abigail, his wife, no one can talk to him. That's a fool. Can't reach him. Doesn't listen. And doesn't care to. He is such a wicked man, he said, that no one can talk to him. A fool is a social outcast. In his own world of darkness. And haven't we seen it? The newsreels of the Howard Hughes. He had the money. He had the looks. He had the power. He had it all. And look what God showed us all. His end. Graphically. Categorized for us in the magazines. The, dis the descriptions. Decrepit person that he was. Both inside and outward. Wisdom prevails. Here's 22. A joyful heart promotes healing, but a drained spirit dries up the bone. The joyful heart here is the contrast to the previous grief that we just had of the parents of a fool. The 20th proverb connected the heart with the tongue, but notice this proverb connects heart to spirit. You see that? We are encouraged to live in such a way as to find joy in life. Look on the bright side of things. Not a depressing view of life, but look for the blessing. John Flavel tells us in his Mystery of Providence, look for the providence of God in everything that occurs. He's there, you know. And He's showing Himself. I think if there is any man that ever would be depressed, it should have been the Apostle Paul. Why, he was in the filth of a Roman prison at the end of his life. I wonder how many coronaviruses had attached themselves to his chains. No one was there to disinfect them, that's for sure. And his life work, think about it. His missionary work, his journeys, Dangers in the city. Dangers in the country. Dangers on the sea. Dangers from this person. Dangers from that group. And what do you have to show for it? Nothing. Why the Judaizers, the legalists, had, were running roughshod over the infant churches that he had planted. And even the regenerate ones he said, we're preaching out of pride, envy. Look at me. Follow me. I'm the, the voice that you need to follow. His life work on the rocks because men were coming in and teaching works to the churches. You must believe Plus, fill in the blank. That's with us today. 
what do we say? What's the, what's the blank there? What's the standard that you would raise for us there? I'll tell you what it is. It's been the same consistently down through the centuries. It is whatever man wants to add to it. It's man judging man. Man creates the standard. Not the Scriptures. Not the Lord God. Man. Laws, rules, standards established by who? Not the Bible. No, the Apostle Paul should have been curled up in a fetal position. It's, it's what we would expect. But instead, there's light coming from that dungeon. It's beaming brightly. He says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. What man of confidence can this be? Except that the skill for living, wisdom itself, so captivates our hearts and minds that we are really looking at reality rightly. And that's what he did. A joyful heart promotes healing. That's the proverb 15.13. A happy heart makes a cheerful face. And Solomon here substitutes healing for the face. Promotes, literally, makes things good, right, beautiful. Healing. The word means to set free. We say, in the middle of the night, the fever fled. That's the idea. Freedom. Freedom from fever. It ran away. A drained spirit. Here's your contrast. Line two means to smite, to scourge. Job 30, verse 8. The great man says, fools were whipped out of the land. Today we incarcerate lawbreakers for their, and in their punishment, and then we deport them off the land out of our society, back to where they are no longer a menace to the freedom-loving people of this country. And look at this word, dries up. It's a state of perishing. It's used in 1 Kings 13.4. There the prophet prophesied against King Jehoram. King Jehoram was a wicked king of the north. And here's what happened. Rather dramatic. God has a great sense of humor and drama. Jehoram raises his hand, points at the prophet, and says, seize him. And when he does, his hand withers. That's your word. Dries up. From 1722, it dries up, it withers to the bone. Oh my! And now he lives the rest of his life this way as a constant reminder that his orders carry no weight. The prophet lived and thrived. So here it is, the bone. It stands for the entire person. So look what Solomon is saying to us in this proverb. The strongest part of a person is their skeleton. That's what holds everything together. And when a person's spiritual resources are depleted, even the strongest of them becomes weak. We should be about one ministry here. 
in absorbing the Word of God under the leadership of this church. We should be about one thing, constantly. Building one another up. Encouraging one another. Encouraging the brethren. Praying for the weak. Constantly exhorting one another in the things of the Lord. That's what we should be about. That's vitality. That's power. Give yourself away. And you'll find your life. And it'll be pleasing to you. And then there'll be great joy and peace in your constitution on a daily basis if you live that way. So let's be about the Lord's business. Building one another up for the purpose of glorifying Christ. Each one of us. And that's the proverb. And that's our lesson. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this message, these five proverbs, teaching us very clearly who is a fool and who is wise. Who has ability and who doesn't. That we would not be caught up by these fragments of the world that would lure our attention away from what we are to really be about. And that is constant service to you. Each one of us. Now Lord, take those that are weak and infirmed physically, make them strong. Spiritually, make them bold. And give to all of us a measure of your constant grace that showers us as we live our lives going through the way of wisdom to the glory of God. And we will give you thanks for what you are doing in advance. In Jesus' name, Amen.